25 mile test oval at the Chrysler Proving Grounds. The event, performance checks of the production model gas turbine car. This was the culmination of tens of thousands of miles in road experience and improved design, resulting in a gas turbine engine specifically adapted to the exacting requirements of today's motorist. These were the trials before this new car was released for limited evaluation by selected users. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. With so much talk about electric cars and the future of auto manufacturing, I decided I would take y'all on to a trip into the past and show you what could have been on the road today. In the 1960s, turbine-powered cars drove on the roads of America. In fact, Chrysler Corporation built more than six dozen turbine cars over 25 years and even built a fleet of them in 1963, which they lent to the general public. Yet somehow, this legendary program is largely unknown to most Americans. In the early 1950s, the jet age was just dawning. The turbine engine promised advantages over the piston engine, which had been powering autos since the turn of the century. It had fewer moving parts, and many of those parts would spin rather than reciprocate, which meant a smoother running engine that should last longer. And turbines could run on a wide range of fuels, not just gasoline. People within Chrysler began considering turbine-powered automobiles. George Hubner, an engineer with a degree from the University of Michigan, was fascinated by the promise of turbine power and received permission from Chrysler to begin working on an automotive turbine. Hubner assembled a team of scientists and engineers and began working on the various issues related to putting a jet engine under the hood of a car. By 1953, Hubner's team accomplished the task. They unveiled the car to the press and soon everyone was talking about Chrysler's turbine car. The first car had some minor issues. When it was demonstrated for the press at Chrysler's proving grounds, it would not start on its own. Chrysler engineers started it out of view and drove it past the grandstand packed with newsmen who were none the wiser. They saw a car that looked just like any other car on the road, but they could tell by the whooshing sound it made that it was being powered by a turbine engine. While demonstrating and testing the turbine car publicly, the engineers continued improving the automotive turbine back in the laboratory. Soon, the second generation engine was placed in a car, and then the third. One of the first major problems the Chrysler engineers worked on was how to make the engine more efficient. A turbine engine creates and wastes a lot of heat. The engineers had found a way to recover the heat and, in essence, recycle it through the use of regenerators. As a result, the exhaust was much cooler than one might expect from a jet engine, and the fuel economy was improved. The car did not accelerate as quickly as some of its contemporaries, but this was something which Hubner felt could be solved. The fuel economy was also not as good as a piston engine, but the automotive turbine was still quite young. With more time to develop the engine, Hubner and his staff were confident the turbine could be made competitive with a piston engine. It was briefly considered as a possible engine option in a 1966 model, but higher-ups in Chrysler realized that even with a short run of perhaps only 500 cars, a massive investment would be required in training and in supplying the parts for warranty and service. The consumer turbine was put on hold, but the development would continue just on a smaller scale. While Chrysler's turbine engineers continued ironing out the bugs with the turbine, the company hit a financial rough patch. Gasoline prices skyrocketed, and for the first time, American consumers began looking for smaller, more fuel-efficient cars. Chrysler had none in the pipeline. Chrysler focused on revamping its product line to compete with the imports and had little time or money to spend on launching a revolutionary new car into the marketplace. Many Americans also became concerned about smog and pollution, particularly the kind which could be attributed to cars and their tailpipe emissions. In 1970, the government announced new tailpipe emission standards. One of the pollutants being measured was the oxides of nitrogen. Due to the nature of how turbines work, their oxides of nitrogen emissions, often called NOx, were substantially higher than those of piston engines. While the big three scrambled to resolve the tailpipe emissions with the piston engine, the turbine engineers knew there was little they could do about these NOx emissions, at least when the turbine was running on gasoline. People realized that the turbine had one advantage that would have sidestepped many of the issues the auto industry was now facing. The turbine could run on anything that burned. The multi-fuel capability meant that the turbine could run on alcohol, kerosene, diesel fuel, or even vegetable oil. 
Chrysler even demonstrated the turbine cars being run on peanut oil and tequila. Some of the alternatives would have lower emissions than gasoline burning engines. The federal government, however, set its tailpipe standards to rigid benchmarks, which were designed for gasoline burning engines and stipulated what kinds of fuels the engines had to run during the tests. The turbines could not compete with different fuels as the feds would not allow it. The turbine engineers continued their testing and experimentation, improving many of the things which people had complained about with the earlier turbines. Fuel economy and performance improved with each generation, but the end was in sight. Chrysler couldn't afford to keep pouring money into George Huebner's pet project. Chrysler teetered on the edge of bankruptcy in 1979 and was forced to go to Washington to appeal for a bailout. Chrysler was almost a billion dollars in debt and blamed some of it on the cost of compliance with the new tailpipe standards. The government agreed to the loan, but part of the agreement called for Chrysler to tighten its spending. Experiments with non-traditional power plants would no longer be so easily funded. Chrysler obtained a Department of Energy grant to develop one last turbine engine as a potential answer to the problems facing the American auto industry at the time. With that funding, Chrysler put its seventh generation turbine into a couple of cars. Compared to the earlier versions, this engine was a masterpiece. Among other things, some of its internal parts were made from ceramic. The last turbine built by Chrysler was the most efficient and cleanest burning, but its cost to manufacture would still have been prohibitive when compared to a traditional piston engine. In 1983, the program ended. It had been 25 years since the first turbine car had rolled out in front of a bank of reporters in Highland Park. Although turbine cars had been successfully built, perhaps as many as 77, and driven by consumers, Chrysler would focus itself entirely on building piston engine cars. The cars would be smaller and meet emission standards mandated by the EPA. They would not be turbine powered. Guys, if you really think about it, Chrysler was truly ahead of their time with this turbine car. Just think about it. It could burn anything combustible and use it as a fuel. That means you can mix any kind of alcohol and cooking oil together. If Chrysler was able to continue building this turbine powered car today, I'm pretty sure with the advances in automotive technology and computer technology, this car will be the number one automobile on the road. And they will probably have an SRT badge on it somewhere. But you have to think about it. It wasn't relying on gas, not for real. So Big Oil probably didn't like that. And that's probably what killed them, Till killed the turbine car. But if I had my choice between a turbine car and this coming electric car, I would choose a turbine All right, that's all I got for today. Before you go, do me a favor and hit that like and subscribe button and leave a comment. I would love to hear what you have to say. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you next time.